Hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webinar, Create Innovative Learning Experiences Using Projection Technology, Learning from the Pros on How to Get Started for K-12. My name is Kevin Hogan. I am the Content Director for eSchool News, and I'm happy you are joining us today for what I know will be a very insightful and important conversation. This event is brought to you by Epson. Epson's flexible and powerful lamp-free laser displays are designed to make the most out of education spaces by optimizing limited classroom space while empowering educators and enhancing learning environments. Built with integrated tools for simpler use, setup, and management, Epson lamp-free laser displays offer big, vibrant images with convenient, user-friendly collaboration options to meet the needs of educators and students today. Now, before we get to our conversation, I'd like to take a minute to go over some of the features of the platform that we're using here for this webinar. The event is being recorded, so you don't have to worry about missing a thing. Within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides. If you have a question or comment for us, there is a chat function that you can launch. Feel free to use this feature to contact someone from the eSchool News team if you're having a technical question as well. But uh, I do encourage any ideas or questions that you may have for the panel, it really kind of helps guide the conversation to, to get to what you are looking for. So now with these housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started with our conversation and some introductions. First, Remy Del Mar. Remy is the Senior Product Manager for K-12 Projectors at Epson America. She spearheads Epson's vision of merging virtual and physical environments through projection and augmented reality technology sectors and works to define new applications. She continues to educate end users on the endless capabilities of creating immersive experiences and promoting the ability to break perceptions of what is and into what can be. Next, we have Meg Athal. I knew I'd mess it up, Meg. Meg Athal. <laughs> <laughs> At the mail. Sorry. That's Meg okay. is CEO of Lumo Interactive. She has spent the last 20 years mastering interactive design and display technologies and designs experiences in games that facilitate new ways to learn and explore. Lumo Interactive solutions are used by parents, teachers, businesses, agencies, and brands all over the world. Meg also plays guitar in a band, writes young adult sci fi, and trains her cat to do circus tricks. We'll save that one for the, for the next webinar, Meg. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ethan Castro. Ethan is co-founder and CTE of Edge Sound Research. He is a hard of hearing music producer, songwriter, engineer, and inventor with Tourette's syndrome. He holds a PhD in digital composition from the University of California, Riverside, a master of arts in music industry administration from California State University, Northridge, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in music composition from Cal California State University, Fresno. He serves as Chief Technology Officer of Edge Sound Research, the Vice President of Edge Original, and he is the Research Liaison of UCR's Experimental Acoustic Research Studio Facility with the uh, appropriate acronym, acronym of EARS. <laughs> and then last but uh, certainly not least, A.J. Freisen's son, uh, AJ is the creative director and CEO of RabCup. As the founder, AJ envisions newly harnessing light with experimental technology transforming everyday events into unforgettable memories. Globally setting the industry standard for over 15 years in live interactive 3D projection mapping and complex light programming, AJ leads a hand-picked expert team from concept to delivery to create awe-inspiring and highly successful productions and large-scale audience experiences. So, wow, there's uh, four real powerhouse bios uh, of experience uh, and insights that I'm really looking forward uh, to participating in, in, in this conversation. As I mentioned to the panel, uh, we do a lot of webinars here uh, at eSchool, but having gotten a sneak preview of some of the presentations and some of the conversation, uh, I think this one's going to be one of the coolest. So with that, Remy, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Kevin. I um, want to thank AJ, Meg, and Ethan for joining us today. Brilliant friends and colleagues. Um, we've worked on projects in the past. Um, a lot has happened in um, display technology as a whole. 
for those of us who are in it, we know that projection tech in particular has always been using futuristic applications from holographic uh, uh, applications to navigation to theme parks and experiential things that have popped up in recent years. But I thought it would be good if we start by asking you to first introduce your companies and what you do and how you got started for the audience um, before we showcase some of the cool projects that you've been working on. So welcome. And with that, perhaps maybe we can start with you if you can talk about, to us a little bit about your company and what got you started. Sure. Um, so I started Lumo Interactive in 2010 uh, with my co-founder, Curtis Walks. Um, the reason we started the company was because both of us, our moms, were special needs teachers, and they wanted to bring interactive technology into their classrooms, and at the time it was very expensive. Kurt and I both have uh, backgrounds in game development, and so when we kind of talked to our, our parents and to other teachers, uh, one of the things that we recognized right from the very beginning was that a lot of schools already have equipment um, or they've got a procurement process that limits them to very specific equipment. Um, so we decided to build a software only solution for interactive displays in the classroom. And uh, the company has evolved quite a bit since 2010. Um, but our focus is still on supporting and enabling and empowering teachers in the classroom. Thank you, Meg. Um, uh, Ethan? Hi, yeah. Um, so uh, my mind's pretty interesting. The the concept behind Ed Sound Research was out of uh, surprise, surprise research. Um, my uh, research at the university was around uh, the concept of trying to see how much sensory information we can get from feeling um, at this point, just sound. Um, and, it, and it turned into uh, a project and it turned into um, a, a company. And now it's starting to go through the whole startup phase and, and we're working with uh, uh, wonderful partners like RabCup and Epson to be able to make immersive installations. One such thing that we did was uh, my dissertation, which was really centered around uh, exempl exemplary uh, this research into a way to do it. Um, and the idea uh, that this comes from uh, is from my own background of being a hard of hearing uh, musician growing up and trying to play instruments. Uh, and, and, you know, for some reason, when they say, you know, you're going to be hard of hearing, don't go into music, and then you go straight into music. Uh, as you heard, there's like three degrees into the music realm. So I'm really not good at listening. Um, <laughs> but uh, at the same time, there's something that that draws, you know, uh, a young person into this idea of uh, a sensory, you know, if, if you if you lose one sense, you're you're compensating by trying to seek more from these other senses to make sense out of the world. Um, and that's a really interesting idea, uh, especially when it causes some other senses to become um, fully embodied in the way that I, I'm looking at the way I'm looking at sound. Uh, for example, one of the ways I was touching the timpani while I was tuning it, um, I you know, can't see the sound wave, but you can feel the sound wave uh, and you can feel the sound waves from other instruments. And that kind of acted like my own eardrum. And so I knew that there was a way to be able to feel higher frequencies and feel this fidelity and feel uh, the world around me. Uh, if only there was a way to be able to on demand reproduce the world around me in that same form factor. So that's where this idea comes from, um, where now we're working with uh, you know the NBA uh, and different sporting uh, leagues to be able to bring some of the action that's on the court uh, into different seats across the stadium. Uh, even taking them, you know, into other virtual arenas or at home, uh, which is a is a pretty wild uh, direction coming from the research that I was doing uh, at university. So uh, yeah, from music to technology, but uh, the most important thing is about trying to understand the sensory information that can be passed along and how to use that in appropriate ways. Uh, for example, as we're talking about this today uh, in student learning, you know, as a student growing up, there's certainly ways to be able to improve the uh, the, the the student um, experience. And I think this this is one of those things where I initially started this off with a grant to be able to help students like myself be able to have a device on their desk to be able to help um, uh, internalize some of the stimulus that was being presented from material. So excited to talk a little bit more about that today. Thank you, Ethan. Um, I want to add um, uh, that, as you know, when I met you, I mentioned my mom was hard of hearing. So your uh, 
project is very close to my heart. As a kid, you learn how to read her lips or her body language to sort of cope and adapt. But of course, technology can really bridge the gap in the future for all sorts of ages. And I'd love to talk to you about that a little bit more. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. AJ? Uh, for sure. Um, RabCup was born out of um, a, a desire to play and uh, disseminate video um, on a larger scale than, uh, than I've been previously working with. Um, I come from a background of uh, design based in kind of more the rock and roll and thea theatrical worlds. Um, and those are wrapped around different technologies, um, mostly, and, and it's mostly come to kind of a video world. So I we love creating display environments that are either holographic or grand or on different scales. Um, and as that technology is kind of worked through over the years, we found ourselves in different immersive kind of worlds, um, uh, whether that's creating large rides, museum scale interactive um, kind of displays or um, or or thing or large large objects for clients. Uh, the other side that we find ourselves in is working more in the uh, the interactive realm a lot and working a lot in classrooms and in learning environments, whether that's in um, in kind of Zen environments where you're slowing people down and having the and having them come together as a group and experience a therapeutic uh, response, or if it's more in a um, uh, in, a, in a in a doctor situation where they're trying to bring them through uh, some kind of other therapeutic response. What we've done with that is created a number of different technologies utilizing display technology, touch screen technology, and projection technology to tell stories and to answer questions and uh, to take complex um, complex problems and help break them down for for an environment, uh, whether it's students or uh, corporate, to to see and learn from. And we find that visual technology is one of the best ways to get those ideas across very quickly um, uh, and uh, and have a tactile response to them. Uh, and engage users. So um, always utilizing new technologies, uh, working with the, the the new advances out there, help us tell our stories better and help us work with people better. Thanks, AJ. For sure. Uh, so I think with that, I'm gonna jump to sort of our uh, rounds of questions, starting with Meg. Uh, Meg, I, I know, well, your starting point and how you started working on educational software and whatnot. and from getting kids engaged and getting away from displays all the way to even helping kids that are on the spectrum. Do you mind talking a little bit about your specific projects for, for kids and um, taking a deeper dive into that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Lumo Play is the name of the platform that we've developed to address the needs of uh, the education market. And what the software does is it makes it very easy to create interactive floor um, or wall, basically create any sort of interactive surface um, in classrooms, in gyms, in sensory rooms, um, and it's teacher friendly. So it's designed so that uh, educators can install and manage the software themselves. Um, and uh, I just wanna share a few videos. These are photos and videos that were sent to us by different teachers and uh, for different educational projects throughout the year, the years. Um, we have installations in libraries and schools all over the world. Uh, and the platform includes so many different types of apps as well as content creation tools. So every single one of these installations is different. They all serve different goals. Some of them are designed to um, just, you know, inc improve activity, large motor skills uh, among kids of different ages. Some of them like this installation in the Carol Wood Day, Day School in Florida um, were developed as part of their STEM program. So the kids are actually building their own games in that school. Um, and often these systems are combined with uh, learning goals. So this is a project that um, teaches kids about the difference between a fact and opinion. This is uh, a project that was brand sponsored and created to teach children about maintaining proper um, balance between your gut microbiome using uh, probiotics. Um, so we have all sorts of uh, different, like different experiences that have been built already, um, continue to be built. Uh, our content is de designed in response to community requests. So teachers can contact us and say, you know, we'd like you to add this experience to the app li library and, and we'll make it and add it for them. Um, 
the way that the software works, uh, Lumo Play is just downloaded from our website, installed on a computer and connected to a display in a 3D camera. All of the components are off the shelf um, and they're very easy to set up. There's illustrated setup guides. And that's, uh, that's basically kind of like how we've structured this so that it's as, as accessible for um, teachers to get started. Uh, you can download the software. Um, there's a free trial available through our website. You can download it like just by setting up an account. So um, yeah, it's uh, we've tried to make it as easy as we possibly could. The interface of the software is very much like a step-by-step -step guide. So there's it walks you through what you need to do with pictures and everything. And then we have you know pretty stellar support. Oh, that, that's my cat. <laughs> Sorry, he's photo bombing the, the webinar. That's okay. It's a cute cat. Um, so are there, you know, I know you've I've seen some of your uh software applications that are really focused on learning. We did the whole math game thing with the um uh, balls and are are there more of those that you're developing or you've seen them be incorporated for student learning specifically? Because those some of those criteria comes from like district level or um, if you can talk about those a little bit more in detail that would be great. For sure um, so as things stand we have over 300 apps available with the public app library um, and those include uh, everything from like um, fi fine large and fine motor skill uh, experiences to apps that um, have specific learning goals like the math um, the math game that you were referencing uh, color identification, um, different types of collaborative and competitive play. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a lot of like environmental experiences. So things that allow you to create these creative play spaces for children um, to encourage like, you know, role playing and uh, physical activity and just social play. So like when people are, uh, when kids are playing with these installations, um they're it, it becomes part of their play environment it's not it, it takes them away it, it sort of like gives you the best of both worlds you get the um dynamicness of a digital experience without the kids faces being in a screen um so they're not looking they're looking at each other when they're playing they're all seeing the same the same thing they don't need to like put on a headset or anything like that so it's a lot more immersive in that sense um we have a lot of uh sort of games that are aimed at 12 and under um, that are topical. So things like uh, sorting or um, like the the experiences that teach you something. So we have, um, you know, environmental uh, ponds that teach you about the native wildlife in a specific region on the planet. And all of these are made according to teachers' requests. So we'll have educators come to us and say, you know, there's a new fossil that's been discovered. We would really like to showcase um, what what that fossil looks like and the dinosaur, the, the traits of the dinosaur that uh, was discovered. And we'll make it and add it to our to our library for that teacher. And then the other teachers get to use it. Um, we also have creation tools so you can make your own experiences without having to learn how to code. And this is done um, purely by like uploading graphics. So if you know how to add a, a graphic to, you know, email, email an image or email a, a video, you know how to make a game using our platform. Um, the multiplayer apps that we have on our platform are largely designed to improve children's social skills. So we, we do have things like sports games where it's more competitive, but um, most of the multiplayer experiences focus on collaborative or social play. Uh, and then this is a, this is a, one of the installations that we put in at, at Epson's booth um, that's played using balls. Uh, we have like a lot of gym specific activities. Uh, some mm -hmm. of them are, are math, some of them are just fun. The idea is just to encourage a collaborative physical activity um, so that every kid is included and so that every child um, understands how to play and there's not like this I, I had a terrible time in gym class as a kid <laughs> um, so we wanted to make a lot of apps for the gym environment and the the um, you know inside recreational activity environment uh, that would encourage all kids to play together um, we also have a lot of apps that were designed specifically for special needs kids, and we have partnerships with families and teachers who deal 
specifically with kids in um, special needs programming uh, to help with things like large motor skill development and with communication um, and just also to provide sensory experiences that help um, with like emotional regulation. Uh, the design tools are super easy to use and like that gives you that gives the teachers and, and educators even more options because then they can create stuff on their own they don't have to wait for us to add it to their library um so yeah our all of our apps i, I mean i wish i could go through every single one of them but there's so many uh, all of our apps are are designed in response to a community request so uh you know the the bigger our community grows the more um the more interesting and the more diverse our library becomes very cool. Thank you. Um, so would you say like most of your softwares uh, or your current assortment of product offering is pre-K and perhaps K through six? It kind of depends on how the educator is using them. Um, yeah. We have installations uh, like the, the one that's in the video that I showed at the beginning where you're determining the difference between fact and opinion was actually yeah. designed for Kalamazoo College. So it was post-secondary. Um, yeah. So in STEM programming and in educational programs, we have different tools that that get used than uh, for you know kids K K to twelve. Um, I would say most of the apps in our our market are are designed to be used by children under twelve. Um, so there's there's definitely exceptions. The snowball fight is kind of like any anyone of any age will play that game for hours. Um, but the uh, a lot of the educational content is is under like kids around grade seven and under, um, and uh, the more complex um, content that teachers deliver to kids older than that, they tend to make themselves. In in some of the applications that you showed us photos, are those me? private and public schools or just private or both? I'm sure that's a question some of our constituents will have in yeah. terms of affordability and scalability. Yeah, so it's mostly public schools. Um, it takes a while to get uh, to become an approved vendor in some of the school divisions. So mm -hmm. in some cases, it's teachers that are just putting it in their, their rogue, rogue systems that are put in by the teacher. Um, but we most of the education most of the educational institutions that we deal with are, are public schools and libraries. Um, there's definitely a lot of private schools and home schools as well that use our, our software. But as a general rule, because a lot of the, the equipment required for these types of installations is off the shelf and a lot of schools already have the most of the equipment that they need, um, it's, it's very affordable. The barrier to entry to putting this into a school is very low. Yeah, thank you, Meg. Um, before I move on to AJ, if um, just like your cat made an appearance, my dog is snoring now, so I want to apologize to the audience <laughs> if you hear something. I don't know how to get up and kick her out now, so it is what it is. But okay. <laughs> yeah. AJ, from what I know, you not only volunteered some of your time to kind of teach about the technology and what's possible, but you've also actually done immersive um, experiences for classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, would you mind talking uh, about your experience a little bit and if you have anything to show us, I'm sure the audience would appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, working in learning environments, we've, um, we, again, there's there's kind of two ways we found with them. There's one where it's more of a tactile learning um, stage where you're reacting to something and the other side is more of like an immersive environment to take you to a different place. So we'll show you some, some examples of both of those. Um this case study is uh, not, not one from our classrooms, but it's one, one I had the best graphics for today. Um, but uh, this is an example of a touch wall that uh, concept uh, and deployment that we've designed that uses um, capacitive ink. So it's a it's a plexiglass board uh, that ha that is wrapped in um, uh, a digital wrap. Uh, and then behind that, there's uh, there's 75 of these capacitive touch buttons. And so that's going to be uh, this, uh, it's a conductive paint uh, that we run to Arduinos or Raspberry Pis. And then those are turned into triggers. And with those, we start telling stories that allows us to, um, allows people to interact with them uh, when we have video projected over the top of that. So it's kind of a layered technology approach that allows you to uh, create a, 
a somewhat immersive world that can tell a story. One of the projects we're working on right now with this is uh, with a school that's connected to a, a NASA Institute um, way somewhere in South Texas. Um, and we're, we're creating a story of the planets for them right now. That's kind of a, uh, uh, tells them where we are and, and what else is in the world. Um, the other side of that technology is more, more the immersive space. Um, I can show you these. It's a project we're in the works right now. Um, this is a, an immersive learning area for children that have peanut allergies, and um, and, they're, and they're going through about six to nine months of therapy as they're uh, getting over that allergy. And there's it's some uh, they're they're testing different foods and whatnot. So with this one, the the request is to create a Zen environment where they could just hang out in. Um, and so this was um, it was going to be uh, printed wraps on the walls. Some yeah. scenic elements were built into it. Uh, we had some ideas of clouds going on. There was a picnic table in this one. Um, and then we worked very closely with Meg on, on a lot of projects. So there's going to be some Lumo play uh, examples put into this world. Uh, and then another concept we're working on with them right now is more based around a uh, kind of an aquarium underwater feel. This is for the older kids where, uh, where the picnic was kind of for the younger kids. But the idea with these is just how to wrap technology into a space carefully um, without going overzealous video game play and, uh, mm. and uh, either give knowledge or help them understand uh, what, what's, what they're learning uh, without just having fast video game, flashy, flashy stuff at them all the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a balance of using technology in the right way. Um, um, the other direction we're going with that is just, is reusing spaces in, um, uh, unused spaces in classrooms uh, or within schools to create um, just uh, calming rooms. Um, a lot of places have after after the events of the last many years have gotten a lot of nap pods and they've gotten a lot of VR headsets, but those are only good for one person and you really don't know what that person's experiencing and you ask them after. So something we're working on right now is just creating uh, projection mapped rooms where you're on, you're in the ocean or you're in outer space and you're floating. So just transport, there are more environments that are about transporting. Yeah, uh, thank you. During the pandemic, we wanted to kind of demonstrate that because we realized that kids can't go anywhere. They were at home. So we started basically embarking in sort of virtual field trips, uh, educational content. Um, the uh, uh, discovery phase for that, because for me it was educational, was my first one. It was interesting. So I'm curious, like, when you work with schools, do they approach you with like a high level business challenge, like, and then you consult them throughout that process in terms of creative content and potential applications and interactivity, or do you proactively reach out um, as a part of the teaching um, project that you work on? And can you talk to me about that dynamic a little bit more? Absolutely. Um, our group mostly, um likes questions being asked. And so we, we're usually presented with a problem um, uh, um, and there is generally no solution. It's what we like to do mostly. Um, uh, we go through a discovery process with that client. It can last a couple minutes. It can last hours or days of figuring out exactly what we're trying to work with and then not use technology for technology's sake, but come up with a elegant solution to that problem utilizing the technology that we know. Um, so from content design to, uh, to installation, um, and we kind of handle all steps with that, where, where you can approach us and feel free to approach us with anything. Um, and we can take that all the way to implementation and, and helping you roll with it as long as it's there. What about maintenance? Like over time, uh, is it a one-time install or is that something that? No, we provide full maintenance. Um, right. We just uh, we just re signed a five year contract uh, with the museum uh, to to mm -hmm. keep their educational uh, installation up. Um, gotcha. It's one year warranty and then uh, and then a maintenance contract that makes sense for for the scale of the project. Um, cool. mm -hmm. Okay, um, I know you've also done teaching um, to about how how to projection technology can be impactful in different environments for high schools. I know you've done it in. Uh, universities can you talk to us a little bit about that or is that just because you have so much free time in between all the cool stuff that you're doing or no it's um for sure it's uh it's i, I went through education um of course uh, undergrad masters and i uh, loved the teaching aspects of that while i was going through those programs 
Um, when projection mapping first came about 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of people didn't know. So professors would reach out to me uh, and the team and ask us to come speak. Um, so we weren't sure what to speak about first, and we just brought our projectors and would show them cool stuff on the side of a building. Um, but it's changed into more of a kind of a, a dynamic class where we're doing a little bit of what you can do, but also a lot of hands-on approach. Um, in November, I'm going to San Antonio uh, to do a, uh, a master class with all, all the high school and junior high theater teachers to show them what's possible using the equipment they already have and then using some off the shelf uh, software that's uh, fairly inexpensive and also free for the first 30 to 60 days for a production, which always helps in theater land. Um, but we actually, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll map like a small stage or we'll, we'll get on their stage and show them how that's done and, and then show them how to string cues together, much like it was a lighting desk and, uh, and really start with nothing and kind of get all the way to uh, a fully immersed uh, dance or magic show pretty quickly. I'd like to sign up for that as a student whenever you're available. Sure. Um, sounds really exciting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Ethan, um, you have a unique technology. Um, and, you know, um, very impressive accolades as well. But in particular, your technology is now being used in classrooms or, is that, you know, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I, it, coming from the research side of it, uh, the technology being new is definitely a, uh, it, you know, there's there's that whole transition from research to prototyping to, you know, first moving then to finally, you know, mass market and starting to get the cost down. So we're, we're still in that process, uh, being a startup company and of getting it down. But uh, something we have realized uh, that helps a lot is, uh, um, like AJ was just saying, is kind of doing um, uh, some of the stuff as a service. So that way it definitely lowers the barrier of entry to get it in. And we work with them as a partner um, and to be able to create the exact space that they're looking for. And then, of course, coming just same with a, uh, a maintenance uh, kind of contract kind of baked into the whole process as well. So it definitely makes sense uh, for, for right now, larger installations as the device is a little bit larger. Um, but on our roadmap is definitely the trajectory to get it smaller uh, to hopefully that first original idea I had, which is plop it on a, the small handheld thing you can put on a desk and then it turns the desk into a haptic tactile acoustic uh, reinforcement to be able to reinforce whatever's happening in the classroom. Which brings us to your other project, the MBA one. Um, I'm sure you have something to show us on that one. And if you can kind of elaborate on how MBA fans can use a full haptic experience. Yeah. Um, yeah so so the, 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 we, we were a part of a um, program. Uh, it's really cool. We we're very honored to be a part of the NBA Launchpad program this last year. And um, we were working with the MBA to be able to understand how we could uh, enhance a fan experience both at the game and potentially not at the game at home or somewhere else. And uh, so one of the things we realized is that, uh, you know, stimulus is stimulus. And if you can grab the stimulus from the court, uh, ball bouncing, people running back and forth, uh, you know, swoosh, uh, slam dunk. Um, those are very uh, visceral experiences if you're up close to them, uh, but not so much if you're in the nosebleeds, right? So uh, what if you could bring that sensation up to the nosebleeds or into a uh, stadium or what's called like the suites or outside the stadium or at home or, you know, in a classroom. So that way you could experience what it's like to be there uh, and, and to get that experience uh, right there on, on the front of it. So it, it's it's kind of difficult to be able to grab and, and, and delineate what those vibrations are. Um, but once you get that point, you can basically reproduce it every single time consistently, um, as long as you have the the uh, device here to that reproduces all those frequencies at the same time from the same device. So uh, by, by kind of approaching this as a standardization way, uh, it means that we're hopefully going to be paving the way for, for others to also come and start making their own specific use case devices, maybe one that's more educational based, one that might be more uh, pro music based, or one that might be specifically sports based, um, who all have different requirements. Um, and so we, we see ourselves definitely as a technology uh, center and we'll do the research and we'll figure out the, the problems and we'll outline them and then hopefully other people will come in and, and help us make it so that way everybody can have the experiences. Thank you. I, I was at the Long Beach Aquarium and they also have a full haptic area where they teach about our impact on the environment. Uh, even though it's not nearly as sophisticated, but the fact that your chair starts rumbling and you smell the ocean, it kind of puts you in that state of mind that you're at the ocean and it kind of makes it more emotional. Um, I've always been a big believer that while VR experience is really cool, but it's 
kind of a solo experience. It's a one-to-one -one experience. Whereas some of the full immersive stuff or um, uh, full uh, sensory immersion stuff that you're talking about clearly enhance learning. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you have any specific examples of that because you're not just hearing right. or watching, but you're also mm -hmm. fully immersing your entire being into the experience. Yeah, um, I will even be able to approach this as one of AJ's uh, uh, pseudo students uh, because uh, AJ and Rabcup helped uh, teach uh, me a lot about how to effectively use uh, projection mapping to be able to uh, share a part of the story that I wrote for my dissertation project. Uh, he also helped me understand the differences between regular projectors and laser projectors and obviously helped me make the connection to Epson yeah. and uh, using the very nice uh, laser digital projection instead of uh, some of the other projectors we might have been looking for because they do make a difference. And uh, that's that's the same approach that we look at as, as the audio spectrum um, uh, because the, the device that, and the technology that we've made is, is something that uh, is doing something that hasn't been done before. It's not just haptic, it's not just tactile, it's actually shaking things so fast that it gets both the lower frequency range of those rumbles and then also this tactile effect. But because we go so fast, you get these details and harmonics in the tactile realm, realm that was previously thought not possible. Um, and so that that needs, you know, the the same type of visual stimulus that's going to be able to compensate for as much acoustic, auditory, and tactile stimulus that you're getting from the whole environment. Uh, right here on on the screen, we we see this uh, this giant kind of uh, screen more or less that we made. It was just made out of OSB uh, uh, roofing wood, and uh, those were actually the the sound source of this uh, installation. So if you think of this as like the walls of a classroom, imagine if the walls of your classroom were the things actually like speaking to you and talking to you and you can go up to it and you can feel the different stimuluses. So there's, you know, trees and, and there's, uh, uh, there, there's like fire and a bunch of other crazy stuff here. Um, we actually scared a, 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 a child. So obviously, you know, the content doesn't uh, matter, um, but the point is that you can go up to it and you can feel the actual texture of what's happening on there um, in, in great detail. The floor uh, is same, similar. Uh, the entire floor was reproducing every single acoustic frequency. So people who are sitting on these chairs uh, were able to feel everything uh, that was happening on screen. If they touch the screen, you'd be able to feel what's happening on screen as well. Um, and the combination of these two is, I think, the point that is very important for, for um, that the research is now saying, which is multimodal interaction helps reinforce the other modalities. So um, th the way that I'm understanding it is that um, having just acoustic or having just tactile is, is one thing. Having both acoustic plus tactile is reinforcing the other because now your brain starts filling in the gaps between those two different um, sets. Having a combined uh, uh, spectrum that can do everything from beginning to end of acoustic tactile re reinforces that even more and allows your brain to fill in the gaps elsewhere. And then having that be reinforced with visual then has this this multiplicative uh, exponential effect about um, sharing whatever the piece of content or the idea that you're trying to uh, bring across. And so my dissertation was really focused on um, if you want to try to uh, share an idea, share an experience, share an environment, hitting more senses is always going to be more effective. And it sounds kind of like common sense, but there's, you know, there's also how you do it that helps the brain be able to make those connections a little bit easier. And it's been really impressive uh, learning about all different worlds, uh, you know, from the, uh, the autistic world, the, the deaf and hard of hearing world, uh, and even the uh, some visually impaired worlds who, who use all of these abilities to be able to help reinforce their perception of the world. And, and I'm, I'm dumbfounded that that we're even making something that might be able to, to take a place uh, in some of this role. So it's been pretty cool looking at that. This is really cool. Also, I dare to say that perhaps it brings a certain amount of equality into the classroom um, to mm -hmm. make the learning available to everyone at once. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm sure in your vision, in your roadmap, this technology will become available to, to the masses at some point. Uh, so yeah. I'm really excited to hear what's next for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, cool. Uh, so. Um, or, I mean, in your opinion, make I'll start with you um, with the technology benefits of everything that we talked about. How can districts or schools get started and and benefit from like the very basic uh, version of some of these applications? Of course, you know, Ethan stuff seems I'm, I'm still digesting, um, but um, you know, I think a lot of our constituents are going to be interested in how do I get started. 
Yeah, and I think it always starts with a need. It starts with, um, you know, as either a learning goal or, um, you know, schools will identify another need, like uh, kids aren't able to play outside as often, or um, they need to be able to accommodate children with uh, accessibility challenges. And um, I think the first step is, um, you know, figuring out what need you are looking to serve. Um, and then the next step is uh, testing things. So um, one of the nice things about where we are in this industry is that a lot of these experiences are very accessible now. So, you know, even if you don't have um, the ability to go out and install this in your school, chances are somewhere in your town, there's a children's museum or a library that has this equipment, you can go and you can learn about it and you can talk to people that are already using it. Um, so I think that, you know, identifying the need and and reaching out to the community at large to, to look at how other um, educators are addressing that need uh, is, in my opinion, the best way to get started. Um, usually we co come into contact with, uh, with people at the third stage, which is that they've, they've, identify that they want to use technology to solve a problem um, and they're looking for information so they can apply for grants so that they, they can get uh, funding approval um, and for that we have on our website an entire article about uh, you know all of the most common information that that teachers would need in order to put in a funding application or to um, start fundraising or to apply for a grant um, so yeah, that that would be sort of my recommendation about how to get started with some of these things. Uh, you know, just to recap, uh, identify a need, reach out to the community, and then start researching uh, what technology um, is available, how much it costs, and what, where funding sources can apply can to to meeting those needs. Thanks. We have a we have a fully immersive room at our new headquarter. Someday you'll. Well, guys will visit and see it. And oftentimes when we show it to educators, the first question they ask is like, I don't have the space for something like that. You're one of the most prolific people I've ever met. Um, you produce a lot of content and put out there. So hopefully you'll write something about that too, to help guide them along the way. Yeah. And as far as space requirements go, yeah. um, you know, identifying the need is, is part of the process of figuring out sure. how much space you need but yeah. um i think the it is very flexible like there yeah. there's when it comes to interactive technology is especially when it comes to projectors um epson has a lot of different options for the types of projectors that you can use and yeah. there's a lot of um hardware agnostic solutions out there to that work really really well with those projectors so um if somebody does have concerns about space like ask, ask, reach out to us, reach out to, you know, anybody who's doing these types of installations and find out what, what you actually need, because you can do a very small immersive room. You don't need to have a lot of space for it. Yeah. I think the questions will come up. How do I comp the space? Who creates the content which you already addressed? And, and then of course the installation. So, so thank you for that feedback. Um, uh, Ethan, you have any thoughts, final thoughts for for audience here as to how to get started and yours may be more on the higher end of the scale, but definitely it's just going to be a matter of time before you figure it out. So I think so. I think so. Yeah. I mean, as your resident sound guy here, um, I, I think that the, the cool thing is that we see a lot of um, other companies wanting to move in this direction as well. I think, yeah, more immersive, more multimodal is going to be the way of the future for sure. Um, I, my advice would be, don't be afraid. Um, try out a small, just like what Meg was saying, you can try a small room, um, experiment, explore, see what the kids respond to. Um, you know, I would have definitely been one of those kids that would have responded very well <laughs> in, in that kind of environment. Um, and also I was getting into technology as, as a young student as well. I was helping with my AV club, my computer club. And I think some of the software that's out there, especially the stuff that uh, Meg was showing is, is very accessible even by students and the students are so creative. Um, the, the student group that we made to be able to continue some of this research has come up with ideas that I in never in a million thousand years would not have come up with myself. And so uh, the kids can surprise you with how creative they can be with the technology if you give them access to it. Yeah, thanks, Ethan. AJ? 
Um, yeah, I, going with everybody, the resources are so out there now. Um, when we got started with this, we were still, I was trying to figure out how to, how to map a, a, a curved wall. And there was, there was nowhere that said anywhere. There was a manual for a computer that said how to put content in and what a dot was. But um, programs like Mad Mapper, one of my favorite for people getting into it, um, their YouTube is not the greatest. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little hard to understand, but there's a, a wonderful woman that made a series of YouTubes called How to Map a Cake. And it explains how to use that software so well and so easy. And you don't even need content. Like with those programs, they have built in content generators. So you can get one, two or three or however many projectors you want set up, shooting in the classroom, shooting at the theater, and just really quickly learn how to do stuff. Things are, um, things are accessible now and they should be tools people can use. Yeah, can I just add something to that? Yeah, of course. Um, all of these technologies have amazing communities and they all have a deep understanding of how busy teachers are. So, you know, if you want to use something, reaching out to somebody in the community that's using the solution um, is often better than reaching out to the directly to the company itself, um, because they're, these communities are, Mad Mapper is a really good example. That community is full of people who are very passionate about teaching other other members of the community and who feel very strongly about helping to support and promote education. Absolutely. The, the, sorry, just to tag on the Facebook groups are amazing. I'm yeah. older, but I found out how discord works recently and those user groups are amazing and people respond very fast on those. And I, yeah, I it restores my faith in humanity. <laughs> like It's amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you. I think that was the, my last question. Kevin, I don't know if there are any questions or comments from the audience. Um, uh, no, I think the, the presentations were so, so effective. People were kind of sitting back and, and, and watching and absorbing it. I do have a, a couple, I guess, that come from the, um, maybe the a boring administrative side of this, uh, as I channel maybe some of the professionals here in the audience. Um, and it involves a curriculum and it, it involves, uh, assessment. And I think, especially when you, you talk about, scale, Remy, you mentioned earlier in the conversation, and um, I just kind of feel some some of the educators might be like, this is all really cool stuff. I wish I could do it. Uh, you know, Meg, as you said, maybe I don't have the space. Maybe there are a few saying, I'm not going to get this past my principal, or I'm not going to get this past the school board, um, that this is a lot of really cool stuff. But how does it translate into uh, tracking progress of students? So maybe each of you can talk a little bit about some of your experiences uh, working with schools and districts and how they've been able to rectify that sort of aspect uh, of just kind of tracking this as effective educational tools. Um, I mean, I can speak to that a little bit. Uh, we've done, like I said, a lot of our content is created on community requests. So we'll have school divisions and teachers come to us and say, um, what kind of content they need to in order to support their learning goals and then we'll create it now having said that there's two ways that we can create that they can pay us to do it which like expedites it um or uh we can add it to the community forum list and those we just sort of make as the requests as they come in um so when it comes to uh, creating curriculum specific content, there's a couple of different ways to do it. And then we also have tools so that teachers can generate their own content. Um, when it comes to tracking the students' um, goals and also doing comparisons, uh, which some schools have started to do of how effective a, a teaching tool this is, um, there's two sides to that. There's the actual engagement with the content itself. So uh, that fossil example that I gave earlier was something that was tied to a test. So there was a learning outcome. It was part of their exam. Um, and they were able to identify more pieces on the fossil because they actually visually interacted with it. Um, and then there's the STEM programming side where children are making their own games. Um, and in that case, the assessment is done at the, at the point of like a child delivering and presenting the game that they've made. So there's a pretty broad spectrum um, and there's almost no end to the type of content that you can create. Um, we also offer quite a bit of support to teachers who are looking to integrate this into their classrooms. Um, if they just wanna hop on a call and brainstorm with us, we do that all the time. 
Um, but definitely like, because there's so many different ways that you can implement this and then do assessments, there's no like one right way to do it. I can, Great, I can just kind of perspective on manufacturer. I'm not in this sort of the education or the creation of the assets, but some of the interests that are coming to us for this particular application, one, they feel kind of like an early adopter stage of hey, I now kind of see the impact of this medium or this application and what it can do, for example, in the case of the Van Gogh experience, bridge the gap of two different eras, where now as a young person, you can kind of appreciate the art of a different era completely or music of a different era. Um, but it's certainly, there are a lot of questions still pending on how you, how you even for VR glasses, how you, um, measure the ROI uh, for expansion. Um, this is just kind of a perspective I'm adding, and I'm sure the team here will have more feedback on. Yeah, uh, Ethan and AJ, I don't know if you have any thoughts in regards to that. In terms you know, of curriculum uh, assessment. Yeah, I, it, I guess it depends which curriculum. You know, I mean, at arts and theater, it's super easy to know how much this is adding to it, and we can. We can create and we can see visual beautiful stuff and i think that's where we fall into it a lot it's, it's kind of on that side I, I come from years and years of loving theater and dancing around and lighting design and that whole world so i mean that helped me a lot um yeah but you know when it comes to those more measured experiences so are we in a science classroom and that i mean I think if you can turn your room, if if you can turn the room into a star, a star a starscape and teach the universe is one thing, you know. I mean, it's, you know, they, I remember they always had the traveling inflatable uh, star dome when I was a kid that you had to sit inside of. And that was always yeah. fun. But if if you could do that on a, on a regular basis or track where satellites are, you know, there's different ways to look at that. Um, and some of these things are more district wide too. You know, I've, I've, we've worked uh, maybe more in a college as aspect, but uh, we will provide a piece of technology that's used interdepartmentally um, as opposed to just being in a single classroom for one use. Um, so th th there's different ways to, to, to slice that up, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly something to be said for intangibles, right? I mean, the, the experiences of, of using these things, there's just, there's an inherent value. Um, just by the, the, the... Yeah, there's also significant research that uh, confirms that multimodal sensory engagement with content improves learning outcomes. And I think we all know that, like, anecdotally, it's mm -hmm. easier to remember something that you have engaged with with more than one sense, as opposed to just sitting and watching somebody lecture. Um, and so I think, like, like Remy was saying, this is very early days for integration of these systems in classrooms. And I think everyone who's involved in this is really eager to hear from domain ex experts like teachers so that we can improve what we're delivering. Yeah, and, and you, you mentioned early days. And I know the, the toughest part of my my job here was gonna be to end this conversation. There's there's so many different places we can go with it and, and go. But maybe just to wrap up, if we can um, maybe ask each of you to kind of look into your, your crystal ball uh, over the the next two or three years. I mean, it seems like this technology is advancing so rapidly and, it's, and it continues to get um, cooler and cooler. But um, in the next three to five years, if you, as the, as our audience sits here, I mean, what, what can they expect to see coming down the pike um, if for the possibilities for their classrooms and, and their schools? Sure. Um, well, one thing that makes it really um, doable is uh, projector companies like Epson creating laser projectors that last longer and longer and are reliable. The hardest part about doing this in the past was uh, a bright projector might cost $40,000 and the lamp only lasts 500 hours and it's 10 grand for every lamp, but, but now they last <laughs> almost. Um, so those advances are helping a lot. Um, we're seeing a lot of changes within generative media and auto creating content. Um, with the whole AI revolution, we can speak to that in a whole other conference. But uh, it's it's helping us create learning, create these programs and experiences much much quicker. You can just ask for it, and it'll show up. Now we're seeing that with imagery, we're seeing that with movies. And uh, if you can walk in a room and say, I, you know, I want to be inside a heart, or I want to be in the top of a tree, and it just generates that for you around you, it's going to make the experience a lot more unique and. One step closer to a holodeck. Not quite there, but you know, at least we can put ourselves in a box with visuals all around us. So 
if I can interject in that too, I although I'm not supposed to, but uh, you know where where we sit, where we're getting kind of requests from different um, types of end users, from corporate to uh, education to content creators to artists and museums. Um, definitely, I want to echo what AJ said that there's all the technological advancements haven't been just on the display side, although that helps, right? Smaller, brighter, more powerful, longer lasting. Technology disappears in the background, so you just experience the experience, which is really this the purpose. It's a means to an end, but also software development, uh, content creation that's become more accessible is is a point of convergence. And then the the the, the biggest uh, hump, I guess, uh, it's always been awareness. And I think a lot of museums and a lot of immersive uh, spaces that are becoming more and more common. I go to one almost every week. I think they're generating that larger awareness that's gonna hopefully bring it all together into the masses, into classrooms in the next three to five years. At least that's my hope as someone who works for the projector division of Epson. <laughs> Maybe if I have a, a little tiny point of, to entry on, on that side of it too, I think the uh, the way to control all of these things, especially as these new technologies coming out, I think having a simplified, unified way to be able to control the whole experience, a la on the way to the holodeck, like what Asia was saying, um, but, you know, having something that controls, you know, for example, we've had, you know, uh, video editors that do audio visual, and then you can do multiple tracks with audio visual, and you can do multiple screens with audio visual. Now, um, there's gonna be more sensory inputs, there's gonna be more um, creative ways to be able to pr to project visuals onto onto elements, there's gonna also gonna be lighting that's gonna be incorporated, like, like strict LED lighting in addition to videos. So I think there's gonna be some sort of um, way to con uh, like a central control station, almost like a multimodal operating system of some sort to be able to help control all of those things. So that way you're not trying to manually do each one individually. It's just like I said, I want this experience and the experience happens. And Meg, any, la any last thoughts? Uh, I, holodeck in every classroom sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it sounds like I, a campaign slogan. Yeah, like I, uh, I did, our company at one point very early on tried to crowdfund a personal um, all-in-one interactive projector for kids. And I still very strongly believe that that's going to um, come to market as soon as the uh, technology becomes inexpensive enough. Um, and I think that the, the demand already exists people are starting to become more familiar with and understand the potential of the technology and with with like sort of adjacent products like VR like um, AI image generation uh, these these technologies are starting to become consolidated and um, people are looking for uh, schools and teachers in particular those that I, I speak to they're looking for ways to integrate these technologies into the classroom because the students respond better um, and it makes it a lot easier to um, make sure that they're all able to engage with the content. So I think it's really just a matter of time before we have, uh, you know, interactive, particularly interactive projection in every, in every classroom. Great stuff. Great stuff. Well, I'd like to thank the panel today for a very informative uh, and positive conversation you know a lot of these webinars especially especially over the past few years have just been very about concern learning loss and recovering from the pandemic and it's just great to be back having conversations about technology and, and enabling uh, kids education going forward so I want to thank you for that and I'd like to thank all of the audience members for for joining us as well as a reminder you'll get an email within the next few days that contains a link to this recording along with the slides. Thanks again for participating and have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.